Hey guys, this is Elise with COVID-19 Mental Health Chats. I'm a therapist and wellness coach, and today Philip Brown is here with me for a short mental health chat. He has worked with hospitals, in hospitals, and in private practice for over 40 years as a psychotherapist and an expert. He has boots on the ground experience with disaster relief and psychological help. Our topic today is mental health first aid. Philip, thank you so much for being here with me. Can you give me a little bit about your experience of what basic signs and symptoms a person could be showing when they are in need of mental health care? Absolutely, Elise. First, let me say it's a pleasure being here with you today. Um, and besides working in hospitals, I also worked as an EMS instructor and EMT for many years. Um, and that's where I got uh, my initial exposure to dealing with uh, trauma dealing with debriefing uh, after critical incidents. Um, we would go back to the ambulance barn and as the uh, EMS instructor, I would lead the group into talking about what they experienced. Mm. So, the sounds, the tactile uh, experience, if the room was hot, it was cold, what they smelled. Um, and we would talk and talk and talk and talk. Um, and we did that as a prophylactic to help prevent the development of PTSD mm. and pretty well. Um, and I'm here today, um, and, and your first question is about signs and symptoms of somebody needing help. And I just wanted to let everybody know that when I go through some of the signs and symptoms, you're going to hear them and you're going to go, yeah, that's me. I mean, I have all of those. Um, and the truth is, most of us, we do have all of them. What makes it different is how often we're experiencing these different things and to what intensity we're experiencing it. Mm. So it's duration and intensity. Um, so if uh, you have questions afterwards, feel free to pop in, feel free to interrupt me. Um, let's have this be a dialogue. Um, Thank you. Among the, the, the signs and symptoms that somebody is in need of some type of psychological help um, are going to be um, abrupt changes, um, changes in behavior, changes in affect, uh, change, and affect being uh, emotion, changes in how people feel. Um, there's going to be changes in uh, manifesting themselves in how people sleep. Are you having difficulty falling asleep? Are you having midnight awakening? In other words, are you waking in the middle of the night and up for a longer period than just taking a and going back to sleep? You know, you're sitting lying in bed and your mind is preoccupied and, and the wheels are spinning between your ears. Um, do you have early morning awakening? Uh, are you awakening, you know, uh, an hour or an hour and a half before the alarm clock goes off? And you can't get back to sleep. Okay, so we're looking for changes in sleep. Um, we're looking for changes in a person's appetite. Um, have you gained weight? Have you lost weight? Um, and not just from a, a change in um, uh, not going out to work. I know a lot of us now, we're homebound. We're sheltering in place. We're not getting the kinds of exercise that we used to. So I think that uh, I'm hearing from a lot of people that it's really normal to put on a few pounds uh, when you're not getting out as often as, as you're used to. Um, but if that weight gain or that weight loss um, begins to, to worry you, then that's one of the signs to seek help. Um, are you having anxiety uh, that at times feels like it's uncontrollable or is it approaching the level of having a panic attack. Um, a lot of people will experience a panic attack as um, uh, feeling like I'm going to go crazy, feeling that I'm going to die, um, exaggerated startle response, um, shaking, shivering. Um, and they usually come in two flavors. Uh, one flavor is a panic attack that lasts about 20 minutes or so and goes away on its own and another that can last three or four hours and is incredibly uncomfortable for people. So if you're experiencing symptoms, 
that's a cause of concern. Um, are you having crying spells? Are you depressed? Are you feeling exaggerated feelings of guilt? Uh, when you start blaming yourself for the War of 1812, you can probably assume that you're feeling exaggerated feelings of guilt. Um, if all the world's ills feel like they're, you've caused them and they're a weight on your shoulders, then that's a time to look for outside help. Mm. Are you having trouble with attention concentration? That's, we're looking at memory. Um, and the first part of memory is gonna be, can you attend, can you concentrate? Um, when people are experiencing the anxiety symptoms that I was talking about a second ago, one of the th main things that's going to happen is it's going to disrupt their ability to move information from attention concentration into short-term memory. So they're going to go through uh, periods of emotional arousal, one of them being anxiety, and they're not going to be able to remember. Uh, the same thing will happen if a person becomes emotionally aroused and they're angry. Uh, it interrupts with the process of encoding things into memory. Um, is there a marked decrease in um, your energy level? Is there a marked decrease in your motivation level or your libido, which is your sex drive? Those are things that uh, often happen and um, are a harbinger that, yeah, okay, I'm getting in trouble. Uh, cognitively, um, are you feeling fogged out? Um, are you feeling confused? Are you having trouble making decisions? Um, there's a lot of people that tell me that cognitively they're feeling frozen. That, um, and, and they attribute it to, to, to fear, uh, a fight flight response. And um, they're, in this state where they're uh, emotionally aroused, they're anxious, and they feel like they're a deer caught in the headlight. Uh, those are some of the basic signs of somebody who's in need of help. Any questions about those before we go on to the next part? No, you're doing great. Thank you so much. Those are some really great points for people to be looking for when, um, when they might be needing some psychological help. Um, I'd love to hear a bit more about how helpers can help themselves in case they get vicarious trauma. And um, even if they're not a professional helper, you know, there's so many people who are now stepping up to help as volunteers in the community, whether Absolutely. they're... Mm -hmm. So yeah. I'd love to hear a bit more about that too. Okay. Um, I think... Um, the first thing you have to do is um, you don't want to become a victim yourself, okay? Um, some of the ways that you can help prevent that is really paying attention uh, and keeping yourself physically well. Keep yourself on a schedule. Keep yourself physically fit. I mean, it's really easy during these times to kind of wake up when you want to, go to sleep when you want to, uh, not really pay attention to that. But really paying attention to keeping yourself on a schedule, uh, making sure that uh, you eat regularly, that you have regular hours, uh, that you don't become uh, sleep deprived, overtired. Um, also paying attention to your needs of your family. Um, we won't deploy somebody with uh, the Red Cross as a disaster mental health worker if they have pressing needs at home. You've got to take care of family first. Okay, so you want to um, uh, make sure that uh, you're spending time with your family and you want to make sure that you have some alone time. Uh, you know, because I mentioned uh, Red Cross mental health, uh, you know, full disclosure, yeah, I am a disaster mental health responder with the Red Cross, um, a disaster behavioral mental health responder with the state of Connecticut's emergency response team. Um, I do EAP work for EAP and public safety EAP. Um, Magellan Health has me going out to do critical incident briefings um, 
in industrial settings and stuff like that. Um, I did respond to Hurricane Sandy. Uh, I responded to Sandy Hook. Um, so that, that's part of where I'm getting some of this other um, information from. Um, you need to network with your colleagues and friends. Um, you need to stay connected. Uh, feeling alone and feeling a sense of social isolation. Uh, what what, what uh, in sociology they call uh, anime. Uh, is, is not the place that you want to be. You want to keep yourself connected with people. Um, you want to um, use the people that you're connected with in the best possible way. Uh, and I'll get to that in a second. Um, you want to keep yourself informed. Um, you know, if you're, if you're part of the COVID-19 Health Professional Health Workers Network uh, on Facebook, you know, check into that group. Check into the, 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 the subgroup uh, for, for mental health concerns. Um, don't become addicted to watching the news. Um, I think you can really drive yourself crazy if you spend three or four hours in front of the television watching the news every night. Um, you, that's a place that you probably don't want to go. Um, you're dealing with people that are experiencing uh, significant trauma. Um, it's important to use your network, use your friends, your family, your professional network to talk about what you've experienced as you've talked to other people's uh, experience of trauma. Um, so it's sort of like being back in that ambulance barn after the incident. You want to talk about it, talk about it some more, and talk about it some more and some more and some more. The more you talk about it, the more of the energy you're going to be letting go. Of. Uh, it's going to help you that way. Um, what did you see? What did you hear? How did you feel? Okay, uh, obviously, if you're doing telemedicine, we're not going to be, uh, we don't have smell of vision yet on our laptop, so it's not going to be what you smelled. Although, uh, in, in real life situations, our auditory, our olfactory memory is directly hardwired to our brain. Uh, it's one of the most intense uh, memories that, that we have. So, when you're looking at, at uh, things to look for, Look for things that might trigger you to go back into the space where you're thinking about the traumas and trying to identify what those things are. Uh, we'll get into that in a little bit later. Uh, any questions so far? Or do you want to go to the next, next question? Sure. That's really great. I would love to keep moving, but um, I do have a... Uh, a spontaneous question right now from what you're sharing. So I would love to hear a little bit more from you, you know, because uh, people have messaged and shared with me that they would love to debrief and process. And, and you talked about that a little bit right now. And, um, and so I'd love to hear a little bit from you about what makes a safe uh, and mindful way for people to debrief with each other, whether it's two people or a group, um, how can they do so in a way that they um, feel like they're responsibly engaging in debriefing conversation um, for themselves and for the other people who are invited to it? Okay, when, when, when I'm sitting and I'm debriefing somebody uh, in a one-to-one -one setting or in a group setting, uh, I want to make sure that I can keep uh, a good part of that person present and here with me because when they start thinking about the incident, their mind is gonna go back there, okay? And I don't wanna have them lost in that. I wanna be able to bring them back here. So even before starting, I may ask them to, to tell me, hey, you know, Elise, what are three things that happened today that were new and you experienced and were good? Um, and it will get them thinking about, um, being grounded, being, being present. Um, and then, okay, well, 
now that now that we're we're here, um, you know, to whatever level you're comfortable, start telling me about what you experienced. Okay, I mean, how did it start? And I think by engaging people and letting them determine to what extent they want to engage and keeping a good piece of them grounded in the present moment. You're pr protecting them from getting over involved in memories that may prove to be uncomfortable for them. Mm, that's a really helpful note. It sounds like, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, I think I'm hearing that when we're doing any kind of debriefing, whether it's as colleagues coming off the same shift or um, a shift supervisor or a department supervisor who is saying, hey, let's all get together and powwow in a huddle um, or an actual um, first uh, mental health helper, professional helper with someone, either way, across the board, it's helpful if the person who is leading the conversation to stay grounded and bring the conversation back to the present moment um, mm -hmm. for the safety of everyone involved emotionally and mentally. Am I hearing you correctly? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, and if you're doing it in a group setting, you're gonna wanna watch to see if you see somebody floating off. Um, and if you, if you need to, you know, you gotta grab up there, grab their foot and bring them back to earth. Um, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I often think of group facilitating like you're almost uh, conducting an orchestra. Uh, ah. You know when to bring in the rhythms, you know when to bring in the, 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 the drums, you know when to bring in this other part of the orchestra. And, and there you've got the violin section and they're floating away. You need to bring them back in and ground them. Beautiful. That's a wonderful metaphor that I feel many people can, can identify with. Yeah. Whether they were in an orchestra mm -hmm. or went to a, a, concert a concert of some kind. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So that's a great and helpful, very accessible, um, you know, image for so many people to latch on to in these times, especially those that have no mental health background, but they can still watch out for someone and, and say, hey, let's, let's get back to the present. And, you know, maybe this is, this is all that we can cover today, but let's debrief again in the future and plan to do it in a structured and safe way where everyone can feel um, grounded and in the present together. Yes. That's beautiful. Um, so, you know, I, I asked that question before you were done explaining some things and I, and I don't wanna get too far from what you were sharing. So I'd love to, to loop back and circle back to what you okay. were sharing before too. If you'd like, well, I think the the uh, the only other point I wanted to make uh, is something that we probably already covered. That it's important to talk about what you're experiencing with your colleagues, and then talk about it some more, and talk about it some more, and talk about it some more. And even if we're doing this on a a Zoom meeting where you've got four or five split screens, uh, you've got. Uh, 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 a bunch of, of different mental health professionals that you're working with and you're all in the same meeting, um, you know, having one person facilitate it, but having everybody watch what's going on with everybody else, um, it can be very helpful and it can be very therapeutic. Mm, yes, thank you so much. I do have one last question for today. Um, given what is going on with coronavirus in the world today, what are the top two things that you would wanna share as a message to everyone in their practice of self-care or their care for others? Okay, um, I think the first thing we have to do is we have to recognize how unique this is uh, a time in our society. We haven't been through, um, most of us alive uh, weren't there for the Spanish flu. Um, mm -hmm. This is, this is totally without, with, beyond the realm of anything that we've ever experienced before. Um, we're being stretched way outside of our comfort zones. Mm. Now, a lot of times we talk about people stretching outside their comfort zones as a way of achieving personal growth. You know, we say, well, how do, you, how do I, you know, well, you need to kind of stretch, but we're <laughs> stretched, okay? Mm. Um, 
So I think taking care of yourself and taking care of your family is your first priority. Because uh, once again, you don't want to be a victim. Mm. That's the first thing I want to share. The second thing is that we are all collectively going through this. Mm. Okay? Um, we need now more than ever look together. Um, this is a, a new challenge for us. Um, there's a degree of uncertainty um, and, and rapid change going on. Um, I think the greatest skill, and I'm not sure exactly how people go about building the skill, but the greatest skill that we can encourage people to build is adaptability. Hmm. How to remain fluid. How to take information in and say, okay, I get it now, it's time to change direction. You know, what worked yesterday isn't working now. We need to adapt. So I think that's, that's the second thing, is that we have to become very adaptive in order to survive. Mm. Those are really two wise parting words. Thank you so much for sharing with us about psychological health, self-care, adaptability, and um, the things to watch out for in terms of personal symptoms that we might be experiencing, but up to now have not had the words for. And um, just so much, so much gratitude with you for this conversation with me on COVID-19 and sharing from your heart and experience. Um, so in closing, um, for those that are watching, please subscribe, comment, engage with me here to let, let us know what you would like to hear more about. And I'll do my best to keep delivering content that might help you or someone that you care for. See you all next time.